I'm, I've lived my life thinking anything's possible, mm. and and I've instilled that in my children. I've also instilled that in everybody that that works for me or with me, in the sense that anything's possible. It's just how much do you want it. Welcome back to episode 003 of The Art of Success. How time flies, right? I can't believe we're already at three uh, down and there's plenty more to come. My name's Ebony Jewel Rainford Brent and this podcast really is all about exploring success and our potential. How can we achieve more? And we've just been gaining insights from people who have achieved some amazing things. Over the last couple of weeks, we've had guests from the world of politics. We started with Alistair Campbell. He talked about winning and people have loved so much insight from him. We talked with Chris Akabusi, MBE from the world of sport. He's a three-time Olympic medalist and some of his strategies were just unbelievable. Some people are already telling me about how they're using it in the world to help them out. And today we're talking the world of business. We sit down with Richard Thompson, an entrepreneur of three successful startups. He's a chairman and founder of MNC Saatchi Merlin, which is a talent agency which has plenty of household names on its books. Think of people like Baroness Karen Brady, Sue Barker, David Gandhi, Denise Lewis, who is my idol. I have to get you on the podcast, Denise, by the way. Jamie Redknapp. The list just goes on. He's also chairman of 24 Group, which was successfully acquired by ITV up to £100 million. So we're talking serious business here. He's also one of my bosses. Uh, He's the chairman at Surrey County Cricket Club and uh, uh, someone who I have spent a lot of time with. I've always been inspired and impressed by how he has this ability to think big. You know, he really goes for it. And so that's some of the reasons why I wanted to interview him today. So he gives us some great insight, especially for the book that I'm writing on success at the moment. His perspective on belief, our attitudes and hard work are really great to hear from him. He's also gives some good insight on his background and his story, which makes sense of to how he's gone about this journey. And one thing that we're both passionate about is social mobility. He's um, also involved with the Debrett's Foundation as well. And so we delve into some ideas on improving social mobility. Uh, look, I hope you enjoy this episode as I did. I just love spending time with people like him. Um, if you enjoy it, please share it, uh, subscribe. I've also set up a Facebook page as well. Um, and so just get involved. But sit back, enjoy um, and look forward to you taking some brilliant takeaways from this one. Okay, Richard, first of all, I'm going to run down your CV quickly. This is I did a bit of research. Tell me what's right and wrong, but it also sounds quite cool. So I've got your born in Carl Shulton, Surrey. Um, you started off working in Croydon as a computer salesman, so you'd have been, what, about 16 or something? 16, yeah. 16, and then you founded First Stop Computer Group, Yeah. Uh, which you would have been 19, Yeah. which is crazy. Young. Yeah, didn't feel it at the time. No? No. No, I, I suppose I was a product, you know, undescribed as one of kind of Thatcher's children, where free enterprise was really lauded, and there was a real drive at the time by the government for people to start their own businesses yeah. so as a result of that it everybody was doing something it was just so easy to do it and i think when you're living at home and you haven't got a mortgage and you've got bounds of energy good health whatever and you just feel why not mm. go for it and at the time it was just seemed like the most natural thing in the world to do the, the sense that I was taking any risk didn't cross my mind didn't cross your mind okay so you've gone on and you've founded three startups which yeah. have all been successful um, and you've they've either been successfully acquired or sold or floated or floated yeah so uh, for business anyway that's a very high success rate you're also chairman of Surrey um, I saw another of it you've obviously got a lot of other things going on two four group you helped production company yeah very proud of 24 so I was parachuted into 24 by a private equity company LDC and I chaired 24 and another company called Mama Group and my uh, role in that group was to support the management but also find an exit um, for the acquiring party which in that case was LDC we managed to um, corral the Mama business which at the time owned Wilderness Global Gathering Great Escape Love Box and various venues in and around London we sold that to Live Nation which was a great exit and then 2-4 Group um, at the time was the largest in- independent production company left in the UK and we did a great deal to ITV mm. that acquired it uh, for up to £100 million 
and unusually I carried on with the management. So normally I would have exited at that point, but I'm still chairman of Two Four, and we're a very large part of ITV Studios. I'm very proud with the brilliant shows that we create. We won an Emmy for Educating Yorkshire, won virtually every other award for our formats and shows that go around the world. Um, and that complements the MC Saatchi role as well in terms of managing people's careers mm. in the world of broadcast and media. So um, the two overlap quite nicely. And also, I mean, we're sat here, I'm looking at one of my favourite humans, David Gandhi. You've got an incredible business here as well. Karen Brady, someone I look up to. I mean, you've now created another business which you've sold a 60% share. To MC Saatchi. Yeah. yeah. Like so yeah, I still chair the business. I'm still very invested as a as a forty percent shareholder in the business. The MSC Saatchi Group's made a huge difference to giving us a global network that we can leverage. We've attracted clients that we probably couldn't without the the power of the groups of people like David Gandhi or Karen Brady or Bradley Wiggins that have got uh, a global footprint and the global profile we can now leverage that through the power of a brilliant mm. business which is MSC Saatchi and also the creativity and the insight you get from being part of a big ad agency so right let's be honest if you go back to being 16 at school did you think you would be sat here right now no absolutely not I mean I, I could go back the turning point for me was 14 mm. when I was told that I wasn't bright enough to sit any O levels wow. and at the time you had a decision to take well not a decision you either did CSEs or GCSE mm. or O levels um, over time I mean after I left school it just became one qualification a GCSE but basically the thick kids did CSEs and the bright kids did O levels um, and I was told I couldn't do any and I and my sister was a kind of straight A student went to non such good grammar school in Sutton I went to the comprehensive Cheam High because I'd failed my 11 plus didn't think anything of it uh, but it was a very, very tough school. There were times where we were locked in classrooms because there were kids going up and down on motorbikes. Oh, wow. Saw teachers in, in fights with former pupils, glue sniffing, sex pistols, punk. It was a pretty grim time in the kind of late 70s. Um, and Cheam High wasn't in it. I mean, ironically, its logo was, or its identity, was the phoenix coming out of the ashes. <laughs> well, I think the phoenix had fallen into the ashes and wasn't coming out, but... So it's, it's reinvented itself now, and the Phoenix now flies brilliantly. But at the time, Cheam High wasn't a great school. I was told I couldn't sit those qualifications. It was a real epiphany for me in the sense that, what am I going to do? Mm. <laughs> Parents were distraught. I played a lot of sport, like cricket. Probably was a bit too distracted over that, but it was... Could you have been a fast bowler? Six foot six? Yeah, I mean, I was a decent club cricket, but I was never going to be a pro. But mm. I, you know, I was the third generation of my family to play for Carl Shorten. I love cricket. Cricket just equipped me for life in the sense of the camaraderie and the relationships you build in the dressing room. Playing with people older than myself matured me faster. I didn't realise at the time. Uh, but it was that moment at 14 when I was told I couldn't sit in the O-levels. Uh, and the worst part of it was that Dad promised us five, promised Suzanne and he put my sister and then promised me five pounds for every O-level that we got and thinking, well, I'm not even going to sit one. So I'm, I'm <laughs> not going to get money, anything. Yeah. And then the school said, well, if, if you really want your son to sit the O-levels, then you're going to have to pay oh, wow. for him to... St- and then, ironically, the cost was five pounds an O-level. So that was a while ago now. So, you know, let's say that was best part of 34 years ago. So that would be whatever five pounds is now. Mm. Um, and mum and dad, you know, three bed semi in Worcester Park, that was still a lot of money. And they wanted to back me. Then I had the added pressure of having to do it, but also the added pressure of thinking I wanted to prove the school wrong. And ended up getting five A's, which for Team High was an achievement. So they still automatically thought I should go and do A's. I couldn't leave school fast enough. For lots of reasons. One, I just felt I was ready and I wanted to work. And also just the sense that the school, I felt, didn't support me and didn't believe in me. Mm. And it was that point that I think the light bulb went on. There were some brilliant teachers there that that went over and above to get me through because I think they felt, this poor kid is the only school, is the only pupil that parents have had to pay for him to sit these exams (laughs) in a shitty comprehensive in Cheap Sutton. So... Um, it was a bit. I was a bit of a one-off in that sense, and I didn't realise at the time. Um, but I was proud I got the qualifications, all my poultry five O levels. But that was it. I was gone. So, if you look from that turning point till now, what do you think? If you could sum up the one thing that's been responsible for you, or the key to your personal success, what is it? A brilliant home life, mm. having the belief, the love, the support from parents who 
um, epitomise that kind of unconditional love you only get from parents, but just that level of support and belief. I mean, it was just astonishing. And again, growing up, you don't think about it. You've got nothing to compare it to, but it's only until you get older and you look back and you realise it was amazing. Mm. And we were, you know, as I say, three-bed semi in Sutton, no silver spoon, and uh, Dad had reinvented himself brilliantly from coming out of the city, working in advertising, and that really inspired me. Uh, sport dominated our lives through the summer and, and through cricket and football in the winter. So I just think it was an idyllic childhood, and I obviously did have way more self-belief than I realised, mm. uh, and I was always quite confident. And in that sense, being able to kind of find myself in the right place at the right time. And I was 83, I left school, 86, I started my first business. Bill Gates invented Windows in the early 80s. The PC kind of came out mm. around then. The Apple II was around the late 80s. Uh, and it was just amazing. It was just kind of you get addicted to the buzz of technology. And I think all I've tried to do in my career is look for the next big thing, mm. ride the wave and find an opportunity and your niche and your USP to create something that's different to anything else. So what do you think drives you then? What is it that has propelled you forward? What is it from within or that gets you going? I love winning. I love winning. I love the sense of achievement. I love the independence of running my own business. As much as I'm part of a group now and I've run a public company and you're responsible to shareholders, uh, I do really enjoy being the master of my own destiny. Um, and accepting everything that goes with that, all the responsibilities and you know, obviously the pressures as well. Uh, but it, it, I wouldn't want it any other way. Mm. Uh, and I feel by doing that, by having being a self-starter, an entrepreneur, whatever, um, has just given me kind of an edge that I, I didn't realise. I didn't wake up one day and said, I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, what I do want to do is kind of run great businesses that are very people orientated and I've always been quite good with people and spotting talent and nurturing talent so that the constant drive I guess you know, I'm 50 now I've got three kids it's important that they see like I saw their father working really hard and recognizing that nothing can be achieved without hard work mm. and if they work hard enough you know I remember going to bed and my dad saying like, I don't care what you've done today but as long as you can go to bed and think, have I tried my hardest, have I done my best? Now that was instilled in me very young and I've instilled it in my children as well. And as much as you know, they might not get the grades you want sometimes and they're frustrating, you see these other amazing kids, I just think, as long as they can go to bed in the evening, look back at their day and think, have I tried my hardest, have I done my best? And it's still relevant and I still feel like every day is a gift and you make everything out of it you can. How much is mindset then? So a lot of those sort of hard work, um, persistence, how much of that is mindset? How much is that ingrained? How much can you develop? And you've got three kids. Have you instilled that? And do you think there's an opportunity to, to grow that part of you? Well, I'm, I've lived my life thinking anything's possible. Mm. And, and I've instilled that in my children. I've also instilled that in everybody that, that works for me or with me in the sense that... It, it's the life... first thing you ever said to me when I met you. We talked about that. And yeah. you, the possibility came out very quickly. Well, and, and you're a, you personify that too. And I think your life and your career reflects that in the sense that anything's possible. It's just how much do you want it? Mm. And we've all seen people that you wonder, how did they get there? You, you, you think, God, they, they, you know, they haven't necessarily you know, got the relevant qualification or had the right training but they've just got this amazing belief and and desire and appetite to succeed and I think it boils down so much in life to how much you're prepared to put your hand up and say I want this and I'm prepared to do whatever it takes and that sits on our website today it's always driven everything you know whatever it takes within reason whatever it takes and I think if you you have good health I mean the only time I can think where I remember getting glandular fever, I couldn't swallow, and I was diagnosed with this weird Victorian thing that, that St. Henry Hospital <laughs> thought didn't exist called Quinzes. Oh, God. And it meant your throat closed and you couldn't swallow your own survivor. And, <laughs> saliva. and I was about early 20s, and I was working, I don't know, insane hours. But I'd literally driven myself to the limits. And that was the first time that I'd ever even thought about my own health. And thought, right, OK, I've got to protect mm. myself a bit here. Um, because I just became so run down. Because I am a workaholic, but at the same time, I, I've got that hopefully more work life balance now. You've got children, but, and there's more purpose in the sense that I can, 
I've never lacked purpose but you know with mouths to feed that just gives you that little mm. bit more incentive and also I'm conscious that you are a role model and when you're in a position of leadership whether it's being chairman of Surrey chairman here people look at you they look at the way you behave look at what you say what you do and that reflects on the whole organization mm. uh, and so I'm very aware of that that self-awareness is is again I think quite important that a lot of people might lack it they can be successful but if they don't know how they want to be perceived or how they are perceived then they don't necessarily succeed what they could talk about thinking big because um i mean there's a great book called the magic of thinking big but i think every time i've seen you and obviously i've seen you operate in the the surrey room in in the management board um i always think you come across as someone who is thinking forward you talk about innovating and and you seem to spot things what is that a natural skill do you think you you developed it or maybe through your childhood but what is it that allows you to think so big I don't know. I think maybe I'm undiagnosed with ADHD or something, but I I, I kind of, I do have a shortish attention span and I, and I very much, I I live very much in the present, in the future. I never look back. I never Mm. dwell. I never think and reflect. It's like what's gone is gone. It's nice to be nostalgic sometimes, but I'm always looking forward and looking for that new thing. And because I got into technology very young and I'm not in technology now, but ironically, you see the way you know the talent business and what's happening in TV at the moment. Technology is driving it all. AI, Alexa, Amazon. Um, what we're seeing through social influences. It just technology is shaping our lives to a degree we have no idea. Whether it's driverless cars, on-demand apps, all of those things, which fascinate me. Mm. In the sense that you know some of it can be quite destructive, but it's just so powerful. Uh, And I love seeing how that can be applied, but I've always wanted to be a leader and not a follower. And and certainly that's something I'm very keen at, again, in every company that I lead, and Surrey particularly. I don't want us to follow what other counties are doing. I want those to follow us. And I want us to take risk Mm. and have the, well, it's it's the cliche, I'd rather people ask uh, for forgiveness than for permission. Uh, And you've really got to believe people or instill in a team that, do you mean that? Do you really mean that? But yeah, I want, I want to delegate the responsibility, not the task for doing something, and empower a team to feel like they can really go for it. And they may fail, they may screw up, but you know, I'm the safety net beneath them, and I'll put my hands up and say, well, I empowered you to do that. That is brilliant. So um, I take responsibility for, for doing that. Um, okay, what about motivation? So I've, I've been asking a lot of sports people, it's easy because they're physically like getting up and putting their bodies through pain, and I ask how they motivate themselves in tough times. But what about for yourselves? I can imagine you've had challenging moments. Do you always Are you always motivated to get up and make things happen? Is it easy for you, or do you have to find... You definitely have moments, and you have bad days, and you, you, know, you could lose a client, lose a big deal... Um, fail to win something that you'd been going for and it's tough uh, which is why I've always made sure you've got to celebrate the successes as much as you can because for every one success there's ten failures mm. you don't talk about the failures but you you need to be motivated to you know <laughs> deal with the challenges that come their way because the average day isn't necessarily just a bed of roses you're going to have problems mm. so I make the most of those successes as they come and make sure that everyone around you really relishes it and says, you know, there's times where I've really made the point, I've flown everyone overseas, we've done some amazing things, just this is what success looks like, mm. this is what it feels like. Enjoy that moment because I want you to relish this because we do this, we achieve that again, you get more of this, you get the big bonuses and and you can do things with your life that you couldn't before. So it's really important to make the most of those things. Um, what about mentors or people who've inspired you through your journey? Do you think that's something that's been important? I've read a lot, and I've read late in life. I uh, I think some Roberto Semler. I don't know. I mean, a brilliant Brazilian book that I read back in the day of how he reinvented Brazil. I mean, they're in a real state now, but there was that. But there was a brilliant book um, called Barbarians at the Gate, which at the time was the biggest buyout by KKR of Nabisco and it was a huge privacy thing but there's so many brilliant books I devour the legacy book about the All Blacks which is a recent one that obviously we've worked out at Surrey but I've picked up so many ideas through those books through other people's experiences and then looking to apply them to my own life or whatever but you know one day I'd like to kind of distill all the best thoughts I've got Mm. Uh, and stick it out there so somebody could think, okay, yeah, that's that's how to do it. But then I think I, I because I run at you know at 
a million miles an hour, I'd never really stop to think. Mm. I'm just constantly, I'm not dwelling to think about, God, how did I get here? I'm just more interested in the next place. I've got two questions that I wanted to touch on. One is how you get things, your productivity systems, because you've got a lot of plate spinning and how you actually manage to do that. And then the other is something that's close to both of our hearts, which is social mobility. But I might save that for a little bit later. So just a quick one. How do you manage all these different projects? Like, how do you keep yourself productive? I think you can only have... Well, I've got one day job, which is here, Embassy Saatchi Merlin, and then I've got a number of non-exec roles which complement the role here, and they all complement each other in their own way. So, number one, be prepared to employ people who challenge you, who Mm. push you, who are bright. Um, We have a, you know, your boss at Surrey, your other (laughs) boss at Surrey, which you called, you know. He's a good example where you employ really good people and, and give them the fuel, the power to do the job and don't micromanage them but um, give them boundaries but at the same time give them that sense of confidence and so I'm always been keen I mean it's a cliche now but I've always done it of recruiting people that are really always going to challenge me and take me on what I'm going to keep going you just one thing you just said there about um, getting good people around you what if you were looking for qualities I'm sat here in your office there's lots of great people around what what do you look for if you're hiring somebody what is it that the key qualities that you look for? I mean, there's a cliche I use a lot, actually, called hire slowly and fire quickly. So <laughs> just take your time to find the right people, but when you make a mistake, which you do, then deal with it quickly and don't be in denial. Mm. So many businesses, you just spend too much time worried about HR issues and dwelling on issues you shouldn't, and you just bite the bullet and say, look, it's not worked. But uh, I think attitude is everything. Positive attitude, can do attitude. People's glass who isn't half empty Mm. um that really feel like there's a kind of a willingness to try and and make an effort people with great business people skills but i would give you know i give a lot of time to people who are loyal um and to people who really are going to try their socks off to make something work and that can do attitude is crucial and for me you know over and above qualifications and obviously i'm an example of that but you know, attitude and behaviours trumps education. Mm. If you've got the right attitude to life, um, then I believe in the environments I create that we can create the rest. We'll give you training, we'll give you support. Um, if you've got that desire and hunger, oh, we'll do the rest. I love that. Um, before we get into last question, I just wanted to ask, what are you, what's been some of your biggest challenges or even failures and how have you dealt with them? I think sometimes when I've taken some big risks... I remember there's some real dark days around the IT side of things when the market moves so quickly and you may have an incredible amount of stock that's now massively devalued. And there was a time where I think if I couldn't have persuaded the then supplier to take stock back, we would have gone under. Um, And they're real moments you never forget. Mm. And that does then suddenly make you slightly more risk averse thinking that was too close. And then other times I can think when I started this business, I didn't draw a salary for three years. Um, and it took a long time to establish a reputation. Mm. And I think that's something I'm very, you know, you've done your homework on me. And in a world of Google, if you screwed up or if you've been successful and it sits on page one, you can't run away from it. Mm. And I'm very, very protective over my own reputation in the sense that that's all you've got. And I trade on that and I'm proud of what I've achieved and I'm also aware that in many respects you're as good as the last thing you've done and you know in a t- as I say today Google good news and bad news can follow you forever so um, I'm conscious that making sure that the way you're perceived the way you want to be okay let's get into this last question which um, and are you still chairman on the De Bretz Foundation yeah. um, which is obviously about social mobility yeah. and um, it's, a, it's a question I'm asking a lot of people about whether we're in a society that allow success to happen I mean it's I think there's of course it's possible and we talk about attitude but whether the system is set up to help more people from diverse backgrounds achieve success so what are your thoughts on 
social mobility. Well, the stats actually say we're one of the, the worst countries, actually. No, we are. We are one of the worst, and I think. And it's horrendous. And I'm a, I'm a really good example of somebody that's benefited when the country was way more socially mobile than it is now. And when you look at the millennials and the PMs, the post-millennials, that could be the first generation to be less well-off than their parents, you have a problem. Mm. And you look at post-millennials in particular who have got really low aspirations, very low sense of um, self in the sense that they just don't feel they're going to achieve anything or own a house and do the things that their parents have done. So, you know, it's interesting the way that as a country, as a, as a nation or as a people, we've now had to positively discriminate to ensure that gender balance is, um, is put right in the boardroom of the workplace, ethnicity is put right, because ultimately you do recruit in your own image. Um, and if you've got lots of men or the pale male style thing, then you kind of tend to reflect in your own mirror, unless you actively just look at the right behaviours, which is kind of where I've come from. But I think I'd add a third now, in the sense that we're actively focusing on making sure there's better gender balance and better ethnicity in the workplace. I think the social mobility thing now is crucial. For instance, I've persuaded every business I'm associated with now to look at the CV, and if that kid's come through the state school, then make sure you make an additional effort to give them work experience or an internship. What's proven now is if kids can't get on the first run of the ladder, and that is work experience or internships, then they will really struggle. Mm. And these are kids with the same qualifications as their peer group, but if that person's parents have got the network and that kid hasn't, they're going to struggle. And that's wrong. I mean, I, I, I benefited from my dad having a brilliant network, um, but it, it, we lived in a more socially mobile world, and now we don't. And so I think we do need to positively discriminate and make sure that kids that have come to the state, state side of things um, are given some special attention, because at the moment it's just too self-fulfilling. I mean, it, you, you look at Surrey and our academy, I think every single child has been privately educated. Mm, and, I mean, there is a sense of social mobility in the sense that Whitgift particularly would just pluck a kid out of anywhere and give them a sports scholarship. Mm. That's kind of social mobility. But at the same time, it means cricket isn't played in a state school at all. And I know, you know, the the Australians summed it up quite well when during Alan Border's era in England were hopeless. I sat in the Melbourne Test with Alan Border just watching the most depressing England performance ever. I go, Alan, what is wrong with us? He says, it's really simple. He's just, I won't use the exact word he used, but he said, you just haven't got enough us in your side mm. you haven't got enough of those nasty characters or those characters aren't necessarily nasty but just a bit of gritty yeah, yeah. yeah that haven't had to fight for it as much and you need that in everywhere whether it's a team an office anywhere you need that balance where kids have had to fight for it a bit more than the others and it's interesting looking at schools now where my daughter's dyslexic she has to work so hard to achieve same or lesser grades as other other schools and there's a school we found recently that are really keen that they're not hot housing kids they don't they don't chase um the qualifications in the sense of exam passes but for them they need the really bright kids to see how the less bright kids or the kids with a learning difficulty do Mm. because they those kids are so bright they just don't realize how hard it is for everybody else and they can see the work ethic that goes in and they need to be humbled by that Mm. so i think the social mobility side of things, I think, need, is so bad, we need to think about how you positively discriminate to ensure that kids that haven't got private education or are coming through the right kind of family system are supported because there's some brilliant kids out there mm. that are just not getting through. And also in keeping those aspirations up for the young yeah. kids and, and seeing that there's opportunity for them, I think, will. Yeah, and, they, they, and, they, and they have to. And I think, you know, the cream, I genuinely believe, will always kind of come find a way to the top but I think it's got a harder route to swim upstream now in a way that it probably didn't have, it, it struggled to before. But we need balance. Everything in life is about balance. And, you know, you look at any environment where you've got too much of the same, mm. whatever that same is, is unbalanced and it will ultimately consume itself until you've got challenging behaviours, challenging personalities that create that yin and yang they create the best environments. Mm. That fosters more success to have those mixtures of personalities rather than all one type. Whatever type that might be, it's just unbalanced and unhealthy. All right, final question. Uh, if you've got a Richard that's now five years old, youngster, growing up, um, 
and you wanted him to tap into his potential and achieve success, what's the one bit of advice you would say? What's the one thing you'd say to the younger you? I don't, I'm going to say I come up with a cliche, I'd rather not, but it was something that I was given to me by a friend in the 90s, but it's something that IBM used. And it was called expectation equals reality. And it's a real simple two words to remind somebody to keep your promises. And if you can go through life and find a way of under-promising and over-delivering, you can achieve anything. I love it. That's perfect. I feel inspired. Richard, you've been brilliant. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Pleasure. I have to say, I absolutely loved that. I mean, I've known Richard for a long time, all over the last few years, especially with my involvement in cricket and at Surrey. But what was interesting to hear was so much about his early experiences around his family, around some of his challenges at school. And it, it I guess it gave me a different perspective on him. I suppose sometimes we just see people, maybe we put them on pedestals and don't really understand the journey. So I, I took so much from him. I'm just really learning so much from this process and just taking it on board I feel like I'm soaking it up I hope you are too and interestingly I've been given a lot of books when I've gone to interview people or books have been recommended Uh, Richard after this interview gave me a book called The Brutal Simplicity of Thought Um, and, and it's a very short read but it really started to get my mind clear and I think it's helping me with how I'm shaping the book and some of the ideas and it's just great to soak up all this information I think I took three key takeaways from this one the first was about when he said at the very end expectation equals reality and that we've got to keep our promises Um, and one thing that I've I've actually struggled a lot over the last two or three weeks uh, we're in the middle uh, here at the moment in the world of cricket with uh, the Champions Trophy in the Women's World Cup and it's been crazy we've been up and down the country um, just all over the place so there was a part of me that really wanted to just say right um I'm going to just, even though I said fortnightly, I'm going to leave it this week because I, I've got, you know, I'm busy. But actually, when I re-listened to this part of the uh, podcast, just uh, on, on some of my travels, I realised, you know what, you, you promised to do something, you've uh, set a deadline, I, you need to stick to it. And I suppose successful people, they make those statements and then they follow up. So he inspired me on my uh, time at the moment just to keep pushing through. Um, The second thing was just around beliefs and attitudes. I think that's the bit I I soaked up the most. What he talked about, um, and and his parents instilled a lot. You could hear how much of an influence they had. But the fact that he says anything is possible, and, you know, I've heard that before, but it's fascinating to hear a journey of someone who has failed their 11 plus. Their parents had to pay for their exams, and they've moved on to build three successful startups they've had you know companies acquired for a hundred million you know that's a a journey in itself that you can struggle at school not get through in that system but yet still go on and achieve that that to me is around belief and he talks about his parents instilling some of the attitudes as well about reminders of you you know before you go to bed have you done your best today Um, and that attitude and behavior trumps education I can really see how that's possible and I actually believe that I think attitude um, and and seeing people who have gone on and be successful in life really really delve into positive attitudes can do and always moving forward but I think Richard really epitomizes that one of the things that I found most interesting, and I've, if you've heard all three podcasts so far, everybody refers to it that they never look back. Um, you heard uh, Alistair Campbell, for example, talks about Jose Mourinho when he chucks the medal. It's like a sign to move on, on to the next thing. Uh, Chris Akabusi used the quote, the, pa- pa- the past is for reference, not residence. And it was like, right, let's keep moving. You know, you can look back for bits you need, but let's keep going forward. And also Richard talks so much about never looking back. It's just he always looking for the next thing and the next insight. And so I just wonder if that's a a key trait of these people is that they're, they're always looking to the future and how they can build a better future. Anyway, I hope you took loads from it as well. I mean, it, I, I'm just loving this process, really loving the engagement as well. So thank you to everybody who's been getting in touch, sending messages, sending things thoughts suggesting people it's just uh, a fantastic thing to be able to use technology i love technology anyone who knows me but just to be able to use it to share right so have a great two weeks um i'll make sure another one is out soon i'm sticking to my promises and just have a fantastic week 